I'm out in the barn with my goats. <laughs> and I'm here with the goats because I want to warn you. I'm going to do you a favor here. I want you to just stop this podcast. If you're watching on YouTube, stop the video. If you're listening to the podcast audio version, just hit pause, go to a different episode. Because if you don't, you're going to learn some things that you can't unlearn. It's going to ruin a little part of your life that you thought was normal, that was safe, that was easy. It's just going to change that. And that's actually why I'm here with my goats right now, because what you're going to learn in this episode, it might make you do something really crazy, like stop buying soap, lotion, any kind of skin products from the supermarket ever again. And worse, it might make you make the ultimate mistake that I try to warn everybody against making, buy one of these guys. A naughty little goat. I mean, as we speak, they're trying to eat my iPhone, so yes, they are naughty little goats. Fell out of my pocket. As homesteaders, we learn things about our food. We learn things about the land. We learn things about animals. We learn things about, <laughs> today, products that we buy that just make us go, oh man, now I don't trust that. Now I have to just do it myself. And in this episode, you're gonna learn about soap, lotion, skincare products, and why you just have to either buy local or <laughs> get some goats and do it yourself. You've been warned, if you're still watching, you're about to be, the truth is about to be told, and it really starts with a problem that I had. Better put these goats away. I was having an issue. Uh, when I would put deodorant on, I wasn't using the aluminum deodorant, I wasn't using that stuff, it gives you cancer and all that. I was using natural deodorants because I didn't want to have that aluminum-based deodorant going into my body. I didn't want to be poisoning myself that way. And, I had a problem with the natural products. I started developing a bad rash. Come here, goaty goaties. Come on, come on in. Come here, goaties. Aust's rash, not what you signed up for in today's episode, right? <laughs> I tried to warn you, I told you to stop listening. That rash <laughs> led me to Laurel Mountain Soaps, a company in Pennsylvania who produces goat milk soap, and their product fixed me. Jocelyn taught me why the natural deodorants were causing me to have a rash under my arms, gave me a product that fixed that, and now I use it all the time. So I had Jocelyn and her husband Tim to our farm so they could teach my daughter how to make goat milk soap, something she's wanted to learn how to do, and just to teach us a little bit about goat milk soap. Am I in touch? Yeah, okay, good. So, um, the last... We got to talking and I learned something that will forever change the products we buy and it's going to do that for you. This is a fascinating episode. Stay tuned. It all starts with a problem that Jocelyn and Tim had with their baby girl. So the whole thing that started this was our middle child, when she was born, um, she had some really serious skin issues going on where especially in her diaper area, it just looked like she would have napalm go off down there every time I changed her diaper. So we ended up down at Children's Hospital. Most of you following our story know we had a similar experience. We had our fifth, our son, when he was a baby, had some really bad allergies. If you know what it's like having a baby with health issues, you know the feeling of just pure helplessness associated with it and how that feeling of helplessness drives you to do anything, I mean <laughs> anything you can, uh, camels anyone, to try to fix your kids. For Tim and Jocelyn, in a very roundabout way, <laughs> that led to them starting their own goat milk soap company. It was like it was like a rash. Yeah, it was, it was really bad 
eczema on her skin, but it wasn't a rash. It was blistered open blisters in her privates. And I tried every brand of diaper from Pampers to Loves to Members Mark to um, anything. And at Children's Hospital, they, they told us, the doctor there said, you need to use organic unbleached cloth diapers with her. And um, they formulated this special bum paste for her. And then she said the soap had to be something natural, no detergent based soaps or anything like that. So that was a difficult thing for me to find anywhere. I could not find soap that didn't have things in it that would irritate her skin. It was so hard. And then finally a friend of mine uh, was making the goat milk soap, goat milk and honey soap, and she let me try a bar and it just worked wonders for her skin. Goat milk will soothe itchy skin where just water-based soaps don't necessarily <clears throat> do that. But because of the um, properties of goat milk, it will it will help with the dermatitis, the itching, and for my daughter's problematic skin, it made a very big difference. Yeah, we just look at the soap as uh, goat milk is one step above making soap with distilled water. I mean, it's just like taking a tenderloin, you have a nice piece of beef, but then you take the middle part, the Chateaubriand, and it's one step step above just a piece of filet that you'd cut off the, the end part of it. So We yeah, always get back to meat. <laughs> I just learned a new uh, new meat tip too today. You know we're going to have a chef also. Well, he's the one. I came up with the originals, things I wanted in the soap recipe. I made my original soap recipe. I used the soap calculator to figure it out. And he's the one who tweaked it and made it better and figured out the timing on the oils versus you know, how far we want the oils with the goat milk and all that kind of stuff. But um, it was a good collaboration. It got to the point where, you know, her eczema started clearing up and she wasn't having issues in the diaper area as much. We were doing the cloth diapers, we were using the wool coverings and all that kind of stuff. So I decided, you know, since I have to use all this soap anyway, and I noticed I wasn't itching anymore after the shower, and he wasn't having problems, and our and our son was, he he seemed like he had like this, I would have said it was keratosis, those little um, bumps on his arms, that started going away, and uh, then we had another baby, and was using everything with her. She never developed any skin issues. I thought, you know what, I'm just gonna see if I can if I can make some and and see what it's like it looked like it'd be something interesting and fun so I started dabbling here and there and I found the oils I wanted in mine because I saw these different um, studies about what they could do for your skin and what other oils were not good for your skin and so we formulated a, a bar and and made some and we liked it I shared it with my mom and dad, and my dad said, uh, well, you know, I go down to the farmer's market, I could take some and see if we sell it down there. And I'm thinking, okay, I doubt anybody's gonna buy my soap, you know? And here it really started to sell. So then I started making more soap, and people started asking me, other friends and things. So it started to go kind of on its own. Jocelyn found herself in this funny position where she kind of accidentally started a goat milk soap company and here she had people who loved her product more than what they could get at the supermarket. When they would apply the soap their hands wouldn't be itchy, their skin felt better, it looked better. Jocelyn did more and more research into why this was the case, what was better about what she was making versus what was on the shelves. And what she learned was amazing. Yeah, so we we just started getting into more things and had people asking, what would you what would you recommend for really dry, you know, chap skin? And, and I said, well, how about a lotion bar? Because lotion bars, they don't have liquid of any kind in them, so there's no liquid to evaporate off your skin, which causes the drying. And there's no preservatives. The preservatives are what blocks the oils from getting into your skin. So if you use like Bath and Body stuff that you know you get commercially, 
there's always a liquid lotion has a preservative in it and some sort of liquid and an emulsifier to make sure that that liquid doesn't separate from you know whatever oils they have put in there well those chemical things to preserve it and emulsify it will block the lotion from actually absorb absorbing into your hands that's why you have those slimy hands and you can't open a doorknob or something it's because the oils won't absorb into the palms of your hands because it's being blocked basically and then you have to apply 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 because your hands are getting chapped and cracked anyway because you have to wash them off to open the door and so they're getting dry and cracked because also it's just sitting on your skin it's not getting into your skin i was going to say it always seems like with that stuff that makes it like you need it more the minute you start using it. <laughs> it's a great marketing scheme. It's <laughs> wonderful because you love this smell and you are thinking, I have lotion, this is helping, but it's not. It's just making you spend more money on their product. Just take a minute and let that sink in. Think about how many times you've used a chapstick or hand lotion. Applied it, it feels good, it smells good. And then an hour later, you're reaching for the same chapstick. You're reaching for the same hand lotion. I remember growing up, my dad used chapstick. He kept it in his pocket. He always had it. And for a brief time, I started using it too. And then I thought, you know what? The more I use this, the more I need to use it. I stopped and I've never used it since. Now I know why. So whenever you have a body butter or a lotion bar or you know a balm for your face or a salve and none of these things have liquid in them and none of them have a preservative there's nothing stopping it from actually penetrating the skin getting in there to give moisturization and i don't use chemicals so anything that goes on your skin is going to get absorbed into your body and into your bloodstream as long as it's something natural that has got health benefits to it, it's okay. I wouldn't recommend putting corn oil on your skin because corn or soy are such compromised crops now that you're going to get something else in your skin. But if you have organic jojoba oil, organic cocoa butter, organic shea butter, and you know organic coconut oil and grass-fed beef tallow, those are beneficial things. They're not gonna get in there and, and mess with your chemistry of your body. So we're looking to bring balance to the skin and not cause trouble anywhere else. And there it is. There's the scary part. Mess with the chemistry of your body. When I heard that, I had to ask Jocelyn more questions. Soap you're buying at the store off the shelf generally you know, one of the things we'll talk a lot about is like, like for example, you buy an apple at the supermarket and the reason that apple's there is because it's the, the, the kind of apple that will survive that lifespan. It's not because it's the yummiest apple. It's not because it's the best for you. It'll last on the shelf the longest, right? What is the downside to what you're usually going to find on the store shelf that people are putting on their body versus someone who might watch this video who wants to learn to DIY it, what, what's open to them possibility wise? Grocery store soaps all contain detergents. Um, the detergents are meant to cleanse the skin and they do a good job at that. Um, but a lot of people uh, really like grocery store soaps because they are inexpensive. You can get them a dollar a bar, you know, a six pack for three dollars, something like that. They smell very, very strong, so their whole bathroom is scented after they have taken a shower. Their skin smells that scent, and so there's a lot of turn-ons for those kind of things. Um, they last a very long time. Uh, that's because of the hardeners that they stick in there. There is something in there that contributes, one, to the hardness of the bar and the uh, lather. It's a chemical, the sodium lauryl sulfate definitely does the lather. So you look on your bar soap, you'll see that. There's all kinds of things in there. Now they might use the natural terminology for coconut oil, but they're using a very chemicalized form of that coconut oil because it's very cheap that way. Anything that's been processed into a commercial form, soy is, is a huge thing now. They put it in everything. And it is a very difficult thing for the body to deal with. 
um, soy is meant to be fermented and in very small doses. Um, but when you're sticking it in all the food and all the beauty products and, and everything, you're just getting bombarded by something that really does mess with the hormones. So you have to watch for that too. Anything that's that they use sprays on, corn, canola, any of that stuff, it's absorbing into your skin. The fat is what stores the chemicals. So if you see canola oil or corn oil in your or soy oil in your body products, in your bath products, or in your candles, that is a potential problem for your health. So maybe you're paying a little more for a bar, but maybe you're not <clears throat> spending so much medically. So, so our, you digest that however you want to separate that up. Yeah. That made sense. The, <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> if, so what you're saying is the, like, one of the reasons why we choose to eat organic stuff is not because, like, for example, GMOs. A lot of people are totally anti-everything GMO, right? right? I think there's some, there could be some good reason for this technology. There could be some use for it. I don't like the idea of we designed this corn so it could be sprayed with a carcinogen, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I don't want to eat corn that's doused in a carcinogen. I, I might not care that necessarily it's a GMO what I care about is why did you make it a GMO to spray it with a, you know, a toxic chemical? Well, I don't want that. So are you saying um, the products that have corn, that's that, uh, you know, like if they're using glyphosate or whatever, it's in the oil. that's what it winds up in the, you said it's in the fat. So yeah. it's in the oil, which is what they're using in the soap. Right. Mm -hmm. One thing that people don't really realize is when you're looking at animals like beef, or lamb, any kind of ruminant animal, they have several stomachs. So they can be eating um, pesticide laden corn and soy and things like that. But because it's going through so many stomachs and going through so much fermentation, the end product is a lot different um, for that kind of an animal as it is for someone with just one stomach like a human or a chicken or something. So if you look at the marbling of a cow or a lamb that has possibly gotten into something that that isn't prime, that you know GMO corn or something like that, you're not going to find the pesticides. Maybe they, there might be a minimal amount, but all that fermentation that happens in their stomachs really does destroy those toxic chemicals. But a plant, there's no fermentation. It's just sitting on there. It's in there. So if you eat the fat of an animal that had pesticides that it ate, you're not going to get all these pesticides in your body. You might have a higher sugar content because it ate corn, so there might be a little more marbling and sugariness in that meat, but you're not getting the pesticides. Plants, they're getting sprayed with it and it's absorbing in. So whenever you squeeze that oil out, you're getting what absorbed into the plant. It doesn't get rid of it. It can really cause a lot of destruction in your system. You use the commercial soap, you're clean, but a lot of people have itchy skin and dermatitis that they don't know what it's from. And sometimes it can just be cleared up on its own by using a natural soap. The downside of switching to natural soap is maybe the cost goes up a little bit but the upside is is you might also not have to use extra lotions extra creams to try to combat the itchy the redness the flaking all those kinds of things um one of the other things is the smells like i had said before the fragrances there are more and more studies coming out that fragrance soap from the grocery store messes with the endocrine system and you don't want to mess with your hormones. That's, that's a big problem for um, women, especially in childbearing years. It's not good. Women going through perimenopause, menopause, even um, their puberty. You, when you're, you're bathing in a chemical that's getting in and it's disrupting your thyroid and your whole endocrine system, it causes a myriad of issues.
bathing in a chemical. Yeah, uh, no thank you. <laughs> there are so many things we learn about, about our food, now about these products that we use, about our environment, the world, the things around us that can scare us. But that's the beautiful part about homesteading. The solutions are usually simple, easy, something we can do ourselves at home, or we can support someone local doing, i.e. your friendly local goat milk soap maker. So by using natural essential oils or phthalate free fragrance in some of our soaps, you know, we, we kind of take that off the table. Okay, so there's no more endocrine disruption. My, my middle daughter, she wants to wear makeup in the worst way. And I'm like, you're not old enough for makeup, first of all. <laughs> but I had, just for play makeup, gotten her some organic play makeup that looked like it was clean to me on the label, right? And she put it on her eyes and they swelled shut. And I'm like, oh no! <laughs> so, you know, That'll teach you to want to wear makeup. Exactly. So, <laughs> I have people say, are you ever going to make makeup? And I'm like, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen it happen time and time again, doing this show, interviewing different homesteaders, hearing their stories. It's what gets us started. The love of our children, the love of our families, the love we have for each other. We want to take better care of each other. We want to feed our loved ones better, give them a better place to live, keep them feeling good, looking good. And eventually we find the way to do that is the same way our great grandparents did it. The homesteading way, keeping things simple, growing them from the dirt, from the dirt to our faces, to our mouths, the way things were done during a simpler time. And that's just the start. Next thing you know, grandma wants some, your cousin, the friend of a friend, the little business starts, and that's what Tim and Jocelyn are now doing. They're selling at farmer's markets. This little business built in just caring for their family, for their loved ones, has blossomed. From there, still had some issues with my middle child with eczema in her um, creases of her arms and the back of her legs. So that's whenever I, I decided I was going to create some body butter. So. We have the two ounce and four ounce of the body butter, and I have only natural and pure ingredients in here, and that seemed to clear up the rest of her eczema issues. So that that went away. And then we had the issue with the cracks at the sides of your lips, you know, in the winter and the chapped lips. And I thought, well, maybe we make a lip balm. <laughs> <laughs> so we made a lip balm, and then you know it came into you know bath bombs. Oh, <laughs> Everybody loves bath those bombs. Are fun. Right? Do you have bath bombs? No, we don't, but I want some. <laughs> well, you have one now, because this is for you. <laughs> so. Thank you. Yeah, so we, we just started getting into more things. And I love essential oils also, so that kind of got me spurned on to do all these things. So we have, you know, of course, our aromatherapy stuff, the shower fizzies for in the shower. Um, and then we recently added shower balms. So... Um, there's beard oil for, for men, the beard balm, and all the different kinds of soaps that we have just kept growing out of people asking, what do you have for this? Can you help me with that? Um, Jewelweed Sav, a friend of mine, had gotten poison ivy. She's not even sure exactly where she got it from. She's got those big bubbles all over. And at the time she was pregnant, she did not want to use steroids because that's what they told her she'd have to use. So I researched what what would help naturally and I found out that jewelweed is the natural steroid to poison ivy. So anywhere poison ivy grows there should be a jewelweed plant growing also close by because that's the way nature works. Your antidote is in with your poison. Okay. Um, so we went to my parents farm and we dug up the jewelry that we could find in the poison ivy. Did you get poison ivy doing we it? We did not. I told him, like, you wear long pants and socks pulled up, you know. The last, like, big construction project that we did before I wound up quitting and coming to do all this stuff on mm -hmm. online marketing and the show, uh, we were digging through a patch. 
we were digging a foundation and we were digging through a patch of poison ivy. And I was digging with the excavator, cutting these like big poison ivy plants in half. And I walked through this trench and I wound up, and I actually would have told you I wasn't allergic to poison ivy because mm -hmm. I had never got a poison ivy rash before in my whole life. And I'd been around it, been fine. Yeah. I walked through a patch where the poison ivy plant was ripped in half and it, the oil was coming out of it. Mm -hmm. And it got right in my leg. It burned a black hole, like a black mark right in the back of my leg. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh man, like normally I'm not allergic, but that was the direct oil. So I figured oh, this is bad. But I had heard that thing about the plant that grows near the poison ivy is the plant that'll fix it. And I was a brand new homesteader at the time. I had listened to a lot of podcasts and I was like, oh yeah, I remember. They said the plant that grows near it is the one that fixes the poison ivy. And that's the Virginia creeper. So uh, let me find some Virginia creeper. And I go and I'm looking and I look on my phone, how to find Virginia creeper. Yeah, that's it. All right, I ripped up the Virginia creeper and I rubbed it all over my legs and on my arms and I rubbed it on the other leg. I was like, great. And believe it or not, it actually did stop itching for like five minutes. It's like, great, I did it. I'm like a homesteader. I'm, I got this. And then I got home a couple hours later and I was like, oh, well, that didn't work because it's jewel weed, not Virginia creeper. <laughs> I wound up with a rash of poison ivy from my toes to my head and everywhere in between. <laughs> that was not fun. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's nasty stuff. But now I know it's jewelweed and not Virginia creeper. <laughs> yeah, you can just use the 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 sap that comes out of the jewelweed and put it directly on to help um, mitigate any of the poison ivy from hitting you. But I made this jewelweed salve. And she used this and it dried up her poison ivy and gave her relief from that. So, you know, it's been a blessing to help other people. So that's that's what we look to do. We, we just want to um, let everybody enjoy good stuff. You can tell that Jocelyn and Tim are motivated by that desire to help other people. Not only were they here at my farm to teach us about goat milk soap, but they also brought all the supplies needed and one of their own recipes to teach my daughter how to make goat milk soap herself. We brought the activated charcoal soap to make. Mm -hmm. All right, so activated charcoal has activated charcoal, it has kaolin clay, we've got goat milk, we've got lye, a little bit of water, and the essential oil mixture. Okay, we have everything pre-weighed out and here's the honey. Um, when you start to make soap, very important that you always have gloves on and it's best to have them the whole way up to your elbow if you can to protect your your arms and you want to wear closed toed shoes you want to make sure it's in a well ventilated area because the lye will give off fumes lye can burn the skin so it's something that you really want to be careful whenever you're working with lye um, the other thing is your eyes you want to protect them anytime you're making soap you can always take the chance of splashing you do not want to get lye in your eyes. So if you do happen to get lye on your skin, you can uh, counteract the burning with vinegar, white distilled vinegar, and it'll take the burning away. It'll neutralize the lye. So with a cold process soap, lye is what makes it become soap. And um, it takes a process of four to six weeks for the lye to neutralize. So what we do is we make the soap, we're gonna put it in the mold, and then we'll show you, we made one yesterday that we can cut today, okay? So I got my gloves on, I have long sleeve shirt on and I'm not gonna be able to fit gloves over that, so I think I'm good. After the Safety 101 was finished, Jocelyn and Tim showed us the process step-by-step -step to make an activated charcoal goat milk soap. And I gotta say, it was pretty cool. So we're gonna start the process here. Um, in front of me I have a, a certain amount of water. This is lye. Um, and then here are our oils and butters that we always already melted down. And um, there's your honey, kaolin clay, activated charcoal, essential oil mix. Jocelyn has all the ingredients neatly arranged in the right amounts ready to pour. 
She begins by taking the lye and slowly pouring it into the water, mixing it gently, and again explains to us how lye is dangerous and what you want to make sure you do when you're mixing your lye. Standing back to make sure I don't get the fumes, and this gets extremely hot in there. And this, this is what makes soap making dangerous because the temperature on this right now is too... That was when we first mixed it was 205 degrees. Right now it's lowered down to 170. So you can get a good burn on 140 degree water. So that you know, at 200, that's what makes it dangerous. If it splashes on you, on your arm or in your face, your eyes. you're gonna know it right away. Yeah. The water and lime mixture was mixed. The next step, Jocelyn poured it over the goat milk, which was actually at the time frozen in little ice cubes. So now you can see how quickly that goat milk, frozen goat milk from ice cubes down to this. If this, those goat milk um, cubes were sitting in a, in a glass, you know, out on the patio, it would take like a 45 minutes probably for them to melt down. Now this okay, is this probably is good. good. Next, the goat milk and lye mixture was added to the mixture of oils. Right now I'm just combining the goat milk with the oils and butter. That's probably good for that. Just to get them together a little bit. And then we take the immersion blender. So now this quickens that whipping. After a few minutes with the immersion blender, the soap is all mixed. And at this point, the mixture looks a lot like a vanilla pudding. Same consistency, same color. And at this point, we've essentially made a basic soap. So we're gonna divide this soap up in some containers where we can mix a little bit of color into them. Now, at this stage in the game, is it pretty much any soap? This is your basic starter? Yes. And then from here, you start adding in the different things that will make a different kind? Mm -hmm. Yes, that's exactly it. So on our YouTube channel, we have a jewelweed soap. And in that jewelweed soap, um, we add, um, there's some calendula petals in there to give it some texture to help uh, get the urushol off your skin. It's just like a, oh, cool. an exfoliant kind of thing. And then... Um, different colorants like lemon peel powder or yarrow or something like that which can be antiseptic and um, exfoliating as well and then that's one of them i think we've done our lavender soap on there too and it's got alkanet root which alkanet root is extremely healing soothing and nourishing to the skin and as it cooks in the soap because this will heat up in this mold that's it's cooking and the properties of those herbs that we stick in there then kind of become dispersed throughout the whole bar of soap. So our goal for our soap isn't just, hey, let's wash up and get clean. We want there to be additional benefits for the person's skin. That's why we use natural colorants, herbs, and, and different things like that to, to get it going. You want a little more? All right, so we gotta get going here with some you, of this. You could thing. just dump this in a mold and just have plain soap. But we do have a plain soap. This is the moment where we take the leap from just a hobby soap maker to professional. We get to watch as Jocelyn and Tim turn just a plain mixture, which is a basic soap, into a work of art, something that's good for your body, good for your skin, that looks beautiful, that somebody would want to buy at the farmer's market. And this particular soap, they start by adding charcoal, this is activated charcoal. So charcoal is very, very detoxifying. It's great at cleansing pores. Um, this soap specifically was meant to help get uh, dirt and grime off the hands and clean out any kind of impurities from the skin. What pairs better with milk than honey? And of course, that's the next ingredient in this soap bar. Yeah, so. Honey to this. Yep, get some honey in there. What's the honey for? The honey gives extra moisturization. If you can imagine baking a cake, <laughs> up until this point, they've been basically working on the cake itself. But often two other containers are plain white soap mixture that are about to get two new ingredients. 
Imagine this as like frosting or a second layer of cake that's a different color. Essentially, Tim and Jocelyn are creating three small batches of different soaps, different colors, different smells, to then pour together in what will be a beautiful three-layer cake, or, of course, in this instance, three-layer soap. Yeah, the first thing is our essential oil blend, which is uh, peppermint, rosemary, anise, and juniper berry. Really, really nice scent. I can smell it right now. It yeah, smells really good. Really good yeah. stuff. And then we add the kaolin clay mixed with a little bit of distilled water just to give this a nice white color. So as he pours, first he pours this, this bottom layer of black and then he holds the bowl up and you can get this white down in it. It kind of penetrates into that black and then he does another layer of black and then another layer of white and he just keeps going in different designs. So that's how we get our, our different designs in our soap. No loaf of soap has ever looked the same. <laughs> As we watch Tim and Jocelyn create this bar of soap, it is a work of art. It's beautiful. Jocelyn tells us there's a lot more to picking what is going into your bar than just how it's going to look. So if you're going to make soap, the first thing you need to decide is what's going to be in your bar. Like what do you value? Are you going for bright radiant colors? Are you going for a healthy bar that everybody can use? Are you staying away from certain things because you think they're irritating or whatever? Um, a lot of people really get caught up in the look and how pretty and with goat milk soap, if that's what you're looking to do, you're not gonna get radiant, beautiful, bright colors unless you use lab colors. And I don't use them because they're not good for you. So they're created in a lab. They're not necessarily beneficial for your body. Earlier in this episode, I talked about how, despite the fact that homesteading leads us down some paths where we learn things that can be frightening or scary, the solutions are usually simple, easy, back to basics. And that is why you need to do one of two things. Maybe listening to Jocelyn has worried you about the products that you and your family are using. Maybe it's made you wonder about what's in your soap or what's in your lip balm. Whatever things you use every day at home, what is that getting into your bodies? You don't have to worry. Homesteading always provides us with a simple solution to get away from the fear. And that's why we're trying constantly to make our lives a little bit more homesteady like has always been the goal of this podcast. So instead of finishing this episode worried, scared, feel empowered because now you know that despite the fact that there's some things out there that you want to avoid and, and not have in your routine every day, whether it's soap in your bath or lip balm on your lips, you have the ability to make a change. And the solution is simple. You can learn to make your own soap. At this point, Jocelyn and Tim are pretty much finished with this bar. They have to let it cure, which takes at least a few hours for it to harden enough to be cut. And then they'll put it on a shelf for a couple months until the entire process is complete and this bar of soap is ready to be used. If you want to learn more about the soap making process, the entire demonstration is available in the Pioneer Library. You can watch Tim and Jocelyn. Uh, the how to make soap demo they did for my daughter was almost an hour in length and you can see the entire thing start to finish there if you're a Homesteady Pioneer. You can check out Jocelyn's social media accounts and we'll have links to all those in the description of this podcast. Jocelyn shares this process through Instagram. You can watch her make different soaps on her YouTube channel. Uh, so make sure to follow her on social media. And there's a couple of books that she suggested to us that you check out and we'll have those books in the links as well. Ultimately, you can make your family soap. You don't even need to have goats to do it. And uh, for some of you, probably a lot of you, it would be easier to just make the soap and do what Jocelyn does. Buy raw goat milk soap from a local source and turn it into an amazing product that not only will your family enjoy, but maybe you too can turn into a little business. Of course, not all of us are going to be able to take the time or have the desire to make our own soap. 
And the solution for us as to how to fix this problem? Well, that's simple too. If you don't want to make your own goat milk soap, support someone who is making a product that you are comfortable using with your family. And I have a couple in mind that you might really be interested in purchasing soap from. You're first. Oh, hi, I'm Tim Fox. And I'm Jocelyn Fox. And we own Laurel Mountain Soaps out of Greensburg, PA. And our website is www.laurelmountainsoaps.com. We decided to make soap because our daughter needed relief from her terrible skin conditions. And now we found that we can be a blessing to other people too. So we've continued to make soap and expand our product line. Tim and Jocelyn sell their soap from their website. You can buy it, they ship all over the world. We'll have a link to their website. If you're watching the YouTube video or listening to the podcast, just check the description. Head on over to their site. They even set up a discount to share with all the Homesteady audience. Uh, use coupon code HOMESTEADY22 for 10% off your entire order. I have to say, never in my life was I ever interested in making my own soap from my homestead. All the things we produce here, this never crossed my radar. But my daughter, who dragged me kicking and screaming back into goat ownership, was really interested in doing this, and I'm so glad she was, because I learned a ton from Tim and Jocelyn. It has changed some of the decisions Kay and I make as far as what we purchase from the store, who we buy our soap products from. I guarantee you there will be more Laurel Mountain products on our shelves. And hopefully pretty soon, there'll be some home study soap products made by my daughter in our bathroom cupboards as well. Worst part of learning all of this for me was the fact that I had to admit to my daughter that I was glad she decided to get some goats. If it weren't for those little rascals coming back onto our homestead, I never would have learned all that I did from Tim and Jocelyn about soap and all this other information that we're able to share in this episode today. So now you have it on record. I'm officially saying that I do not regret <laughs> buying goats again, and I'm really excited to see what amazing products come from the couple of little noisy bundles of energy that we have jumping around our barn. Of course, I am not endorsing that you or anyone you love ever buy a goat for yourself. Remember, friends don't let friends buy goats. <laughs>